Good evening and welcome to the ARCO Forum at the Kennedy School of Government, the Institute of Politics. Um, we are here tonight for the seventh in a series of programs conceived by the Boston Herald, Making Massachusetts Work. This program, How to Restore the Public's Trust in Politics. Uh, we've assembled a very interesting panel for you tonight. The sponsors of our program this evening are the Kennedy School of Government, the Institute of Politics, of course, the Boston Herald, and the Taubman Center for State and Local Government here at the Kennedy School. Uh, our um, uh, first uh, speaker is, is someone to acknowledge the participation of the Herald, Ken Chandler, the editor of the Boston Herald, who will say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as we're running a little late, these will indeed be a few words. I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts here tonight. Um, and I'd also like to uh, remind those of you who may be interested that uh, these proceedings are being taped by our friends at Boston Cablevision. And I believe it's going to be aired next week on uh, Channel 23. So if uh, you want to have a second look at it, uh, that's where to find it. Um, thank you very much. I think it's going to be an interesting uh, evening. and. We look forward to it. Thank you very much, Ken. We are about uh, big questions tonight. I think all of you know, I think all of us as Americans know, that something has gone wrong in our politics. Uh, the symptoms are all over the place. Back in 1964, which some of us don't see as a real watershed year for confidence in government and politics, when you ask people, how often do you trust the government to do the right thing, about 76% of them said most of the time. Today, it's about 35% or less when you ask the American people, how often do you trust your government to do the right thing? Uh, Americans have never been truly in love with politics. We've always had a healthy kind of um, antagonistic attitude toward those who run for office. They are them and we are us, and we had better look out for them. But in recent years, I think, uh, the feeling of the anti-government, anti-politics feeling has reached levels of near contempt, uh, at least uh, high levels of anger and frustration and cynicism reflected in the uh, term limit initiatives on the ballots, uh, people who say they would not run for office, young people at this very institution who say they would like to work in public policy, they would like to make laws, they would like to make regulation, but they would not like to run for office. That's for somebody else who can stand uh, the criticism, who can stand uh, the um, levels of, of near contempt. Tonight, we are about not only describing what's happened in uh, our system, but talking about some ways uh, to restore trust and confidence uh, in politics and government, and particularly in the state of Massachusetts, which for somebody like me from the Northwest, it seems as if that anti-politics feeling was almost invented here, packaged and put together here so that uh, it could be exported uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, it's very hard here in Massachusetts, as it is in the rest of the country, but politics has a very hard edge here for someone who comes from the West Coast and is observing uh, what goes on in Massachusetts. So what can we do about that? Well, tonight we've assembled uh, three, four people who are going to be able to speak to that issue, and one of them, at least, is going to be able to give us a broad national perspective on what, in fact, has gone wrong uh, in our politics and why. Uh, E.J. Dion is a staff writer covering ideas and politics for the national news staff of the Washington Post. Before joining the Post in April of 1990, he worked for the New York Times, first covering state and local politics from 77 to 80, then the presidential campaign of 80. Following a period as a foreign correspondent, he was named chief national political correspondent and received his second nomination for the Pulitzer Prize for political coverage. Dion also helped to establish the New York Times CBS News poll. He's a 1973 graduate of Harvard. He attended Oxford University from 73 to 75 as a Rhodes Scholar. His book, Why Americans Hate Politics, was published in May of this year. But perhaps most importantly in terms of Mr. Dion's credentials, qualifications to be here tonight. Uh, from 1973 to 75, while a student here, he served as a member of the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee, which certainly qualifies him on the subject of politics. 
Paul Salucci was elected Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in November of 1990. Prior to that, he served 14 years in the legislature, first for four terms in the House, then as Senator representing the Middlesex Worcester District. In 1989, he was elected Assistant Republican Leader. In 1988, he chaired the Massachusetts campaign for George Bush. Barbara Anderson is Executive Director, Citizens for Limited Taxation. She started with the organization as a volunteer collecting signatures on a state tax amendment in 1977. She served as Administrative Assistant for CLT and in 1980 was named Executive Director. She writes a bi-weekly column in the Patriot Ledger and appears on a weekly talk show on Boston's WRKO radio. Barney Frank is serving his sixth term in the United States House of Representatives. Prior to entering Congress, he was a member of the Massachusetts House. He's held staff positions in the Congress and was executive assistant to Boston Mayor Kevin White. We'll begin with E.J. Dion to set the stage for us, 15 minutes or so. Then we'll follow with each of the panelists for five, give E.J. another shot, and then we'll go to your questions and comments from the floor. E.J. Dion. Barbara Anderson. I read the book. That's going to put me at a disadvantage. Um, well, you wait till I'm through before you say whether I'm blessed or not, EJ. Because um, I'm, I'm going to try it here to, to address the subject matter, which is how to restore the public's trust in politics, by rebutting the basic assumption. Why would anybody want to restore the public's trust in politics? Politics is the art of destroying faith in government. You're not supposed to have trust in politics. You know, it's really hard for me to imagine that back in Mesopotamia about 6,000 years ago, on Monday, people invented government and then on Tuesday night decided to hate it. And it just didn't work that way. Somewhere there was an interim. And in that interim, politics replaced government. And then we decided to hate it because they worked at giving us reasons to. Keep in mind that both government and politics started in the Middle East. So we've had government and politics in the Middle East longer than anywhere else and look where they are. So this is not a good sign for the future of our hemisphere. <laughs> now, EJ's book is great, it really is, and I wish you'd all read it because it'd be easier for me to rebut it if you had all read it. And what he said is true, and, and I started out reading, and I can show you here, EJ, I started out reading and I was underlining everything because I agreed with so much. And then I realized it was silly to underline everything because at the end you end up with you know, no way to determine what you particularly liked or didn't like. So I stopped underlining. But by the time I got to the end, I realized that though it's a great book and it really the, the concept that you just gave us was, was terrific, it missed the point entirely. <laughs> because he focuses on symbolic issues and how some of us fiscal conservatives and, and people, I mean, my, my philosophy is very much like Paul and, and, and Bill Wells. And I think everything Paul said tonight is absolutely accurate. And they're doing their best to restore faith in government and what he says needs to be done needs to be done. And I, I certainly share the political philosophy and I understand what you're saying about the left and the right because I've always been uncomfortable with both the left and the right too. But you're missing certain basic items because what people are angry about is not the ideological differences. What people are angry about are little items that inspire public hate, hate such, as, such as the following item. Recent, I'll stick with the Herald here to start with. Recent Herald headlines. Some are ideological. Weld asked DYS to block release of admitted killer. And you ask yourself, why does Weld have to ask DYS to block the release of an admitted killer? Or study, Congress favors spending over cuts, 43 to 1. And that fits in with the ideolo ideological point you're making. But these are the ones that people focus on. Flynn employees get bargain rents on city apartments. Relationship pays off for friend of T retirement on board. PAC money buys what voters can't. Guards at Deer Island cash in on workers' comp. You all saw that article in the Herald, the particular sentence, at the Deer Island House of Correction, one guard is collecting $422 a week in workers' compensation because he claims he is traumatized by working with people in blue uniforms. <laughs> and to be fair, I'll mention some other newspaper headlines. Food stamp fraud, mistakes cost one billion. Foley says House will no longer fix members' parking tickets. Broker milks public pensions for private profit. Broker bank use pensions for gain. And speaking of banks, there's a little matter of the SNL scandal, which EJ does mention. Can we talk about the SNL scandal and restoring trust in politics in the same form? How? Item, the federal government, going back to um, the SNLs. And then here's a story that was in the Herald last week on Graham Rudman. 
the thing that they told us was going to fix everything, which was, I suppose, in, in, in originally ideological. In 1985, Congress passed Graham Rudman Hollings, which was designed to eliminate annual budget deficits by 1991. This act was amended in 1987 to extend the deadline for a balanced budget into 1993. In 1990, though, the act was essentially scuttled. The government was so far away from meeting the fixed budget targets called for in Grad Rudman Hollings that Congress eliminated the fixed targets and instead ruled that the targets could be, quote, adjusted for a good reason. How far afield is the current deficit from the original Graham Hollings? The original law would have had the budget balanced by now. While the 1987 revision said the annual deficit could not exceed $50 billion in 1992, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that the actual fiscal 1992 deficit will be a new high of $362 billion, which is more relevant than a discussion between conservatives and liberals. The other thing that, that people really love is when the hypocrisy of, of people in government. They pass laws for themselves and then exempt themselves, or pass laws for us and exempt themselves from the laws. Here are the laws that Congress has exempted themselves from. The Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and we all know by now that they've also exempted themselves from laws against sexual harassment. So it's this sort of thing that causes us to look askew at government. Here's the state government, and I'm, I'm going to skip over our state government because now Paul and, and Bill have that under control. <laughs> but let's. Let's run down to Connecticut to take a why are taxpayers in Connecticut angry because they perceive there's an ideological difference there between the people running the government? No. Two weeks before the election, with his lead slipping fast, Weicker ran an ad on, and, and did an ad on Connecticut television stations in response to his opponent's charge that he was in favor of an income tax. And Weicker's ad said, and I quote, I'm Lowell Weicker with a message for John Rowland, he said in his most gladiatorial voice. This is out of the... Uh, on the New Yorker. Stop distorting facts and scaring people with misquotes and half-truths. Long before your negative ads, I was opposed to a state income tax. The people of Connecticut, and I know, it would be like pouring gasoline on the fires of recession, and nobody's for that. Then, of course, Weicker presided over an income tax increase, and when he was charged with this, he said, quote, I never made any damn pledge, but even if I had, I would have broken it. <laughs> Now, you want to know why the people in, in Connecticut are angry? Local government. Um, city of Chelsea, here in, Ma in Massachusetts, gone into receivership because of corruption that has been going on in that city for years. And the solution that will be coming soon from the receiver, raise property taxes on the same people in Chelsea. The, the town of Weymouth just had an, a vote on their local election not to raise sewer fees. Town meeting met again a couple weeks later and raised sewer fees in defiance of what the voters wanted. This is the sort of thing that voters can, can, can focus on. We can't restore public trust in, con in, in politics. It would be very, very dangerous to have trust in something that is operating with stolen money. As long as they can take our money without our consent, there's no reason for them to act in ways that inspire trust. Look at people who like to change things, like Bill and Paul. The game on Beacon Hill right now, despite Paul talking about all the, the cooperation, have you been watching it the last couple days? The big game today, or yesterday, was Let's pass a pay raise for state employees so we Democrats can tell the state employees that we voted to raise their pay, knowing the governor is going to veto it so we don't have to come up with the money. Now, do you really think state employees are going to buy this? And do you think that's going to make them like government anymore to know that this silly game is being played? The game on Beacon Hill right now is not to govern, but to make sure that the opposition party can't. And that is still a fact of life. But sometimes things do get done. They told me just 15 minutes ago that I have to have a solution, too. So. I come up with a solution. Sometimes things get done, and that's when the voters get involved and learn to play the political game themselves. Now, I've hated politics all my life because I felt helpless. But once I joined Citizens for Limited Taxation and found out about the initiative petition process, I no longer felt helpless, at least about city and state government. Now I have some control. Prop 2.5 gives me some control at the local level. The initiative petition process at least get, gives me a chance to be a player, and my members a chance to be players on Beacon Hill. So we feel we're part of the process, that they might still take our money, but they're going to sweat blood to do it. And in the process of our knowing that, the hatred dissolves, and we too can find some of this amusing. At the, at the, at the national level, we don't have the initiative petition process. So we're frustrated. Now we've come up with another idea, which is term limitation. And as long as we can make them uncomfortable, and we are making them uncomfortable, it's, that's more worth it than passing it. You know, the next three years, while they worry about it, they might actually start to shape up because of their fear of it. 
And as long as we, the voters, become part of this process and have their attention once in a while because of something we can do to them while we play the political game, then possibly we do have some control and things will change. But forget about restoring trust in politics. Politics has abused our trust for 6,000 years. Citizens should concentrate instead on learning to play the political game. Thank you. I want to thank EJ for the kind words, but uh, having been congratulated for candor, I suppose I should indulge in some and <laughs> say that the credit isn't entirely due me because uh, I must in candor say that not all of my candor was voluntary, so I don't know if I get entire <laughs> credit for it. Some of it was, some of it wasn't. The, I do have a difference with EJ's approach and Barbara Anderson's approach at, at one level. And I find one difference that I have with both of them is the theoretical construct or the mode of analysis in which politics is something that happens to the voters. The voters are, in fact, the author of much of their own discontent. EJ said they have false choices. Well, they nominate the candidates in the primaries. People who were unhappy with the choice in 1988 of George Bush and Michael Dukakis ought to understand that no Martian had any hand in the selection of those two as candidates. We had primaries and caucuses, and the people had a chance to participate. And if people choose not to participate, that's a valid choice. That doesn't make it right or wrong. But a, a theme, and, and the same I would, I would disagree with Bobby, she said, well, voters have, can now get involved. They could always get involved. They get involved, in my experience, when they are unhappy. When people are happy, they tend to be less involved in politics. When they get really angry, they get more involved. Talking about term limits as the answer seems to me to be a very backward way to do it. And term limits don't bother me uh, personally, so I, I, I'm not losing any sleep over it. But in fact, what I think term limits will do is, if you get them, give a lot of politicians a lot more job security. Because nobody's going to bother to run against you until the term is up. The term limit will then become the term. And people will say, well, why take him on now? He's going to be gone in a couple of years. Why get him angry? Uh, in fact, if people don't like the politicians in office, waiting for term limits is really a very inadequate way to go. The thing to do is to beat people. And people tell us, oh, you can't beat an incumbent. I wish. The fact is that when people get angry enough, they can beat incumbents. In the Massachusetts State Senate last year, as Paul Salucci knows, incumbents got beat. Incumbents who never had any idea that they were going to get beat got beat. They got beat by people who didn't know they were going to beat them. <laughs> and, they, and they beat them. In New Jersey last year, in New Jersey last year, they defeated vast numbers. I mean, last month, they defeated vast numbers of people. What happens is when people, now obviously incumbency is sometimes an advantage in various ways. And I think at the congressional level, we should go further. I outlaw the newsletters altogether. I don't send them. But in general, people underestimate what the voters can do. And EJ talks about the voters being angry at some kind of tactics. Well, I must tell you, there are very few politicians who run for office with a pre-existing commitment to a particular tactic. People do not say, as a matter of religious preference, I'm going to engage in tactic X. People tend to engage in the kind of tactics that get rewarded. And having the public blame the politicians for campaigning is like blaming the TV programmers for TV programs. In fact, in both cases, it tends to be consumer driven. Second point, not related, just in a list. And uh, it has to do with one reason why voters are angry at one particular segment, uh, that is Democratic presidential candidates. And I, I have not read EJ's book, I will say. I, I have read EJ's book the way people in my line of work read everybody's book from the back. We look in the index for a name, and then we read that part. <laughs> Bookstores in Washington, bookstores in Washington near the Capitol have the books face down for ease of, <laughs> for ease of thumbing. But if you really want to drive politicians crazy, Bob, don't talk about term limits. Write a nasty book and don't have an index. <laughs> but what? But the main reason I didn't read EJ's book yet is that I just wrote one. And uh, I didn't want to read it because I thought I might be too heavily influenced, and now I'm going to read it. But my book was in part about why the Democrats haven't done better in the presidential elections. And I do think that there was a very specific situation that we have here. I believe since 1968 and all the trauma of that year, 
we as Democrats have spent much too much time trying to make sure that our left was emotionally happy. Not enough time trying to take issues and put them in terms that would appeal to people in the center. And to that extent, I think there's considerable overlap in that part of the analysis uh, that E.J. That e. Gion does. I do think that Democrats have, in fact, overindulged our own left, not so much substantively as rhetorically, and have therefore disabled ourselves from presenting a better alternative. And that is one reason why one alternative that should have been available to people, a sensible liberalism, that, that I think is partly the political explanation for some of what E.J. talks about, where I agree, where people have undervalued the market and have tended, I mean, have undervalued what seems to me to be both politically and substantively a very good thing to do, namely take people who had other people and lock them up. Yes, there are people who ought to be locked up. We Democrats have been much too apologetic about talking about that because of a, I think, fear of 68 and 72 coming back again. Third point, and I think this is the major issue at the national level, why we have the frustration. And I think the other problem I have with some of these analyses is that they are not historical enough. Although, Barbara, I must say, going back to Mesopotamia, was probably too historical. <laughs> but many of the things that are listed as causing anger are, in fact, of fairly significant duration. There are people, as I look out, sitting in this audience who could tell you stories about Massachusetts politics that would be far more angering to the voters than the things Barbara just read about. I mean, there was a time when, for Massachusetts politician, term limits were a good thing because it meant you would get out on good behavior. <laughs> so we are, and the same is true at the national level. I agree with many of the criticisms. I also believe that our politics is today far less corrupt, far more honest, conducted with a great deal more efficiency and vigor than at many points in the past. Why, given that, is there, as there no doubt is, so much more anger today? I'm not entirely sure, but I will take a, 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 a shot at one thing. I think at the federal level we have overpromised, as Barbara Anderson said with Graham Rudman, in none of which variants I ever supported, I must say. I never voted for it. So I, I, I complete not guilty on all that. But what we've got, I think, is a situation where we have overpromised. The problem is that some people are reluctant to stop overpromising even when we can. And I think 1992, and I'm very optimistic about this, is a very important year for us. For 20 years, America has tried to out Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson. He played baseball against baseball team, football against football team. We've been playing baseball and football against two teams, same day, at the same time. And it doesn't work well with only 10 players to take a compromise. We have been engaged in an arms race against the Soviet Union, and which they were able to keep up because they had no civilian economy, using their very efficient repressive mechanisms not to have to have one. So they were able to keep roughly even with us militarily. At the same time, we have been engaged in a civilian competition with almost every developed society except the Soviet Union, because they didn't have to have a military. We are the only society in the history of the world that could ever have contemplated doing both simultaneously. So I don't think we ought to be as self-flagellating as a society as we should have been. We now have the chance, thanks to our victory in the Cold War, which again, historically, we have not allowed ourselves as Democrats to be enthusiastic about because of our left. Uh, one of the things we were inhibited from doing was talking about the obvious moral superiority of our system to the communist system. Uh, and we've got to break that. And I think liberals ought to participate in celebrating our victory in the Cold War. But what that does is free up about $150 billion a year in military and intelligence spending that we no longer need. And what that means is I think we can break out of some of what's causing anger. Because I must say I tend to agree with Bob that much of the anger is substantive in its, in its uh, uh, motivation. People feel they are paying too much and getting too little in return. You may argue about whether they're realis their, their expectations are entirely realistic. Uh, sometimes we do get the feeling that people want things but aren't fully aware of the consequences. And I'm always reminded of a uh, truth imparted to me in 1969 when I was working at City Hall by a uh, great statesman philosopher named Freddie Langone, who said, <laughs> when I was complaining about what I thought was an inconsistency on the part of people who wanted swimming pools built in an area, but complained about the construction trucks that seemed to me an inevitable part of building the swimming pool. And he leaned over and patted me on the knee and said to me, hey, kid, ain't you heard the news? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, and I think that political truth, that political truth is part of the problem. We have a chance now, however, 
to break out of some of that dilemma. We have a chance that's rare. We have built a level of government that tried to do both, that tried to provide a decent standard of living, compete with the Russians in the arms race, compete with the Japanese. Ironically, I think historically the big criticism of Ronald Reagan is going to be that he was too much like Lyndon Johnson, who tried to fight the Vietnam War without in any way cutting back on the great society. And while Reagan tried to cut back on domestics, when he couldn't, he then went forward, and we went forward with him in a kind of a joint effort. And we wound up trying to do too much. I think we overstrained the American system by this all-out arms race and all-out civilian effort. We now have the ability to shift, oh, three or four percent of our GNP, I believe, from the military area which we've won to the civilian area where we haven't done as well without sacrificing one iota of our security. I think if we set about doing that well, we will have done a lot to alleviate the anger in the way that is most sensible, and that's by really producing results. kind of anti-tax campaign that was started with Howard Jarvis and Paul Gann in California and moved so successfully to Massachusetts with Barbara Anderson and her friends. And it focuses so much on the peccadillos and the errors of government uh, to, pull, to cause such public anger that you end up cutting the programs that help people that government does, and then everybody's mad at the government. So I'd like to sort of hear a response uh, from as many people as want. Yes, well, I'll start with that since I'm the, the, sort of the object of it. Um, it. It refers in a way to what E.J. was saying and what Barney said, too, about how poor politicians are more honest now. And yes, they are. I mean, politics isn't as corrupt as it used to be. And that's because primarily the press lets us know what's going on, and activist groups like mine, there are a lot of activist groups, both left and right, that make sure the public understands that message. So I would say it's just the opposite. Um, also, I would respond already to Barney's book, which isn't even in print, Why Democrats Haven't Done Better in Presidential Elections. They don't want to. I mean, you do understand this, Congressman. The Democrats love it the way it is. The ideal situation is for the Democrats to be able to blame the Republican president and the Republican president to be able to blame the Democratic Congress. I mean, tell me it isn't nice on Beacon Hill. Everyone talks about, gee, isn't it awful that, that the Republicans are in charge. Charlie Flaherty and Bill Bulger love the fact that Bill Weld is there. They can blame him for this disruption you're talking about, for the things the programs cut. They can blame Bill Weld, who doesn't mind. He just accepts all of this and can handle it very well. And of course, the Republicans can blame the Democrats for things that aren't getting done. So the two-party system is, is simply existing so that they can blame each other, and it works out really well. But you certainly can't blame the activist groups that call this to people's attention and point out the errors and the problems and the fact that we, the people who pay for it, aren't going to put up with this anymore for the fact that, that it's happening. We don't, you can't blame the messenger or the media, and you can't blame the taxpayers and activists who pay for it all and resent paying for it all. Bernie? I disagreed with some things Barbara said in the past. I must tell you, Barbara, the legislative levels institutionally, I don't think that's a problem at the federal level. Yeah, I'll yes, respond, sir, Jim, I'll, I want to respond uh, too. Okay. Um, because Let's I think that, that, that's quickly. an excellent okay. question. And it's something that I used to wonder about when I was, when I was, as Barney would recommend, naive instead of cynical. And I'm not giving up one inch of my cynicism. I work much too hard, Barney, to get as cynical as I am. You cannot be too cynical, ladies and gentlemen. I used to wonder why my state rep from Marblehead was, had no power at all, while Senate President Bulger, who was elected by just a few people in South Boston, had all of it. And it seemed to me there was something essentially wrong with that. There's also something essentially wrong with the system in which, sure, once in a while they throw people out of office, but 85, 90% of the incumbents win. And when you see how they do the redistricting, you'll understand why. And by the way, Congressman, you've already taken care of your friends in the legislature by giving them an exemption from their federal income taxes if, <coughs> if their legislator is living far enough away from the state house. So all of that has already been taken care of. They take care of each other, and that's why people are cynical, and that's why people ought to be cynical, and should continue to be cynical until the behavior ends. One sentence, the leadership in state legislatures tends to be too strong, and the leadership in Congress tends to be too weak. Agreed. Let's get these last two questions, E.J., and then I'll... Thank you. A uh, very brief question, please, for Ms. Anderson. Ms. Anderson, uh, for the last close to a decade, I've lived here in Massachusetts and have worked in state government, and now I'm at the Kennedy School, very involved in government, obviously. And I've watched your career with a lot of interest, for lack of other words. I'm very curious about your role, if you could help define, I want to make sure I understand it correctly, 
On the one hand, I've been very uh, interested and, and excited about how you've been able to mobilize people. I think you've done a great job with that. But at the same time, I think that you've almost come short in, as uh, you said, being a cynic and not proposing solid solutions. I'm trying to find out very clearly what the role is that you see yourself playing in Massachusetts and in Massachusetts government. Um, and also, secondly, I don't know if this proposal has been done before, but I think it'd be great if you could spend a semester here, because while we could learn a lot from you, especially mobilizing, I think with all due respect that you really also have to do a lot of learning about government and take it serious beyond the point of just being a cynic. And I think it's very important to be a, uh, a skeptic. But to be a cynic, as I think uh, you were drawing the line, and Congressman Frank was also saying, doesn't really add anything to the debate. And I want to know why you feel that way. Is that your role, just to be the watchdog, or do you think that you could be more than that? No, the, what I started out being was I believed in the system. I believed in the people who were running the system. I had this long list of heroes within the political system, and then I met them all. <laughs> and, and I still have some. Um, and I still, our role right now, our role is, is just delightful right now. We had to spend eight years of hell fighting Michael Dukakis because nobody else was doing it. And if that doesn't make you cynical, then I suggest you come out of the Kennedy School in your ivory tower and get out in the political world on Beacon Hill and find out what it's really like. Sit through an all-night session sometime up there and see all of your ideals go right down the drain as the people you believed and trusted in sell their souls for a presidential campaign that they don't even believe in. So I understand all, all of what you're saying. Now I have, again, somebody to believe in, and I believe in Paul, and I believe in Bill, but I see what's going to happen to them up there. If they don't keep their ability to sustain the veto next year, they're going to eat them alive, and they're going to enjoy every minute of it, even though they're going to regret, as I said earlier in standby, that they no longer can blame each other. Because what politicians like to do, and there are exceptions, I suppose, but they like to have somebody to blame. Now, you'll hear the, de the liberals and the Democrats talking about the deficit. They blame Reagan for the deficit. They blame Bush for the deficit. And yet, just tonight, we talk about a $362 billion deficit. And Barney Frank stands up, Congressman Frank, my good friend, and talks about $150 billion that we can now shift from, the, so from, from a military de expenses to civilian expenses. What about that <coughs> deficit that you've been so critical of? That's put it toward the $362 million deficit. Then we'll only have a $150 million deficit. But they want to criticize. They want to use the other party as the scapegoat. But they don't really want to sit down and do any solutions because that's hard work, and that isn't what they're there for. Well, well, they're one, one correction, if I can... And all they do is campaign. Let me, let's, let's I just spent four years there, and I can leave you with one rebuttal, that it's, it takes a 1,000 horses to build a barn, but only one jackass to knock it down. Let me, let me just say that I have to respond to a very... Uh, Barbara, you surprised me with the depth of that misunderstanding. I did not say that I wanted to free up $150 billion for government spending, which you seem to have understood. I said we could shift it from military purposes to civilian purposes. I am surprised that you, of all people, would automatically equate civilian purposes with government. Civilian purposes include <laughs> private sector activity. That isn't remotely what I have in mind. In fact, I have been very clear elsewhere that I would be for about a 50-50 shift. And I think that underscores my point. Your eagerness to prejudge without listening, in some cases, I have to repeat again, you are suggesting that the Democrats are deliberately losing the presidential election at the national level no, simply to no, speak to ignorance of those people. No, I'm just saying they don't mind when it happens. It doesn't, secondly, they don't mind when no, it happens. No, that's not what you said. You want to change it? But secondly, I never said $150 billion for the government. I said for civilian purposes. Wait, you, you automatically translate that into Could I just have one government. minute here, Barney? Just a second, Barbara. Are you recommending Barbara. a $150 billion Barbara. tax cut right now? Is that what you're saying? You want a $150 billion tax cut to go back to the private sector? Is that what you're saying? No, what I want... That's a news story for any reporters in this audience. What I want them to do wouldn't be a news story because I've said it several times, but you don't listen. I don't think you're private sector it. is. Would you please? No, you're the one. Please, you're trying now totally to turn this around. You're the one who, when I said civilian, thought I meant government. I mean 50% in additional domestic government spending and 50% in... tax in, cuts? No, the de deficit reduction. Your question was a deficit. I think what the do, most... What do you call a civilian? A civilian uh, is somebody who's not in oh, government. That's yes. a tax cut. Barney? I, no, I'm Barney sorry, but I wait, wait a second. I no, want seriously. To respond to this. Seriously, wait, wait yeah. one second. We're at, we're at 9.30. You guys are fighting the 60s and 80s, and we're literally losing no, the 90s. No, that's not I'm not fighting the 60s so, and 80s. I, I'm sorry. I have been totally misquoted here, and that's just not acceptable. All right, then let's clear it the up and move on. The fact is, $75 billion of deficit reduction means $75 billion less that the government is taking from the private sector. It's $75 billion more that's available for private productive capital. And that's what I meant, and it is your total misconception that led you to think otherwise. What about the deficit? I said I want to reduce it by $75 billion with half of that savings. This, this gentleman over here has the last question. Okay, I'd like to thank you all, and, and it's really exciting seeing this because I believe in what uh, Ms. Anderson said, 
and Mr. Salucci said, because just recently um, I ran for city council here in Cambridge. And I was upset because, I, and the theme to my campaign was if you're upset about a uh, run and if not, just vote. Mr. Frank, you had stated that the, um, the Democratic uh, was caring too much for the far left and, and with no really results because the far left is in the worse situation now than it was prior to uh, the great concern from the Democratic Party. Now, I formerly was part of the Dukakis machinery and knew how that was set up. What do you think you should do now and besides moving more to the right to address the concerns of the left? Because the recession that's now facing many uh, of folks that are in the middle class was always in the far left class and now we're in a depression, moving towards a deep depression. So uh, what, what I believe is what I said before. I think we ought to begin now making a reduction of about 50% over a three year period in the amount we spend on national security, use half of that for additional domestic programs, half of it for deficit reduction, which by reducing the extent to which the federal government sucks in private capital to finance its deficit, frees up that amount of private capital, reduces the pressure on, uh, on the private sector. I think shifting 3% to 4% of our GNP from this fight against communism, which we have now won, to civilian purposes, both public and private sector civilian purposes, over a three year period, is enormously promising, and I think we, if we do it right, we'll find ourselves uh, three years from now doing a much better job of providing the quality of life we want for ourselves in the both public and private ways without in any way, shape, or form sacrificing national security. Mr. Salucci, just one question to him because... No, it, yours, was, he, yours was the last... Yours okay, was, I know, but Mr. Yeah, Salucci... No, your, your question I, was just the last. one... Res Real Mr. Quick. Salucci, okay. <laughs> Mr. Salucci... Quicker. You say that... that uh, you must treat everyone with dignity and respect as the person, as, as the government persons that, that they work for them. In other words, you work for me. I'm a public citizen. I'm a taxpayer. I'm a voter. I'm a Republican. I've come up to your office, the governor's office. I'm a man with new plans, new ideals, requested opportunities to meet with you, and have not been given that opportunity. Can you tell me why, after I am a Republican who ran for an office in this city as a Republican and didn't get no, no kind of response. I, I can't tell you why, but I'll find out why. Okay, and well, can we meeting. schedule one? You'll, you'll get a meeting. All right. <laughs> DJ, uh, you wanted to say a couple of things. I wanted to just close with two thoughts. One on a very much earlier question about the possibilities of the, a Weld-style Republicanism nationally, uh, which is I think that the Republican coalition is really splintering into a couple of pieces that the Weld-style, if you will, libertarian kind of Republicanism probably speaks to 20 to 25 percent of the electorate. That's a pretty big chunk. Uh, and I think that there is some possibility that that will, I, I th I'm almost certain that that kind of republicanism will gain ground uh, in the Republican Party over the next 10 years. Uh, the second point I want to make in closing is to say that the recession is a great tragedy for a lot of people, but I actually think it may have positive effects for our politics because I think that, that after a long time of focusing on peripheral issues or on strange divisions in the country, we're now being forced to deal with real basic things like how do we stand competitively with the Germans and the Japanese and what's going to happen to our standard of living in the long run. And so I pray for the sake of all the people who are suffering that the recession ends, but I hope we use the recession to bring our politics back to something more serious that addresses real problems that people face. I don't know, uh, I don't know how much faith we have restored in, and trust we have restored in <laughs> politics this evening. I know that we have resurrected uh, a very vigorous and uh, aggressive and long-term debate between Barbara Anderson and Barney Frank, <laughs> which at least was amusing to us. I don't know about you. Uh, and I want to thank E.J. Dion and Lieutenant Governor Salucci for being with us and for pro providing their participation in this panel. Thank you to the Boston Herald and to the Kennedy School of Government. We are adjourned.